the last ice age, Siberia. A mammoth is nearing the end of her long, hard life. She's seen many winters and born many calves. But her luck runs out. She becomes trapped and hungry predators prove her undoing. We found teeth marks on the bones. Skin was not cut by knife, an example. It so was it's been eaten. torn. Yes. But encased in permafrost, her body would survive the millennia until its discovery in 2013. The remains of a mammoth nick nicknamed Buttercup are the subject of a new Smithsonian Channel documentary. It's called How to Clone a Woolly Mammoth. The female walked the earth 40,000 years ago. She was found on an island in northern Siberia. The program follows scientists, including Tori Herridge of London's Natural History Museum. Tori, good morning. Good morning. The tusks were actually found in 2012, mm -hmm. but the real, the, the real remains were found in uh, 2013 in Siberia. Mammoths have been found before. Why was this so special? Well, it was, it was in that, that 2013 excavation that its real specialness came to light. When they were trying to excavate out the carcass and they cut into the flesh, because it, its flesh was there, right? This red fluid started to ooze Blood. out of it. Well, of course, that's exactly what they immediately thought. It's like, oh my goodness, can you imagine that? Like, you're, you've found this like ancient beast that humans haven't seen walking the world for you know, 10,000 years or thereabouts, and then there's something that looks like blood coming out of it. I mean, I'd have run a mile. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, they thought, okay, maybe we've got some kind of flowing blood. And if the blood's so well preserved, then what does that mean for things like DNA and stuff like that? Right. So the next step, of course, was to verify what that fluid was and to take the next step, the autopsy, to take samples and look in more detail at its flesh and things like that. I, you know, I was thoroughly engrossed, I have to mm -hmm. say that, but, but I, I, I'm a bit squeamish, so when, when the guy, one of the scientists, took a bite out <laughs> of the flesh, I couldn't believe it. You were on the autopsy team. Yeah. What did you learn? Oh, loads. We learned absolutely loads. I mean, just, just going through the process was a journey of discovery for me. I mean, I'd worked on fossils up until that point. Mm -hmm. This was my first experience of a kind of flesh and blood <laughs> mammoth carcass, if you like. So I was learning the whole time. But more than that, I mean, you can learn so much from an animal just by looking at its teeth. So her teeth, we could see that she was in her 50s when she died. Mm -hmm. So we knew she'd lived a good long life. But then we start to get inside her, her abdomen, her stomach area. We found her liver. Ooh. I mean, I had my yeah. hands on 40,000-year-old mammoth liver. And there were these strange white stones in them, which we think are probably bile stones. You know how humans get gallstones in their gallbladders? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, elephants and mammoths don't have gallbladders, so bile stones accumulate in the liver. So maybe that's a sign that she wasn't very well towards the end of her life. She was old. Mm -hmm. And maybe that might have explained why she got stuck in that bog in the first place. Was she maybe weak? Has she come, you know, coming towards the end of her life anyway? Yeah. But she got stuck in that bog, and then her actual death seems to have been a little bit more gruesome than mm. just kind of dying of old age and sickness. Tori, what does it mean to have actually found her blood? Well, I mean, that's really remarkable for certain scientists. There was a guy on the autopsy who you'll see in the program who is just divine, Roy Weber. He was so excited about this. He works on mammoth hemoglobin. That's the stuff inside your red blood cells that picks up oxygen. And because these mammoths were living in cold climates, we're pretty sure their blood must have been specially adapted to taking up oxygen at cold temperatures. So he was super thrilled because he thought he could actually get his hands on an actual molecule, if you like, of mammoth hemoglobin. From the cloning point of view, it's actually the flesh, the muscle tissue, that's probably more important mm. for the Korean scientists because they want to get their hands on a mammoth cell with all of its intact DNA. It's the Koreans who want to do this. Yeah, yeah. there's some, a group in South Korea who are trying to clone a mammoth using the material from this mammoth buttercup. There's also a group in the US who are doing something a bit different. They're trying to create, if you like, a new type of animal, a synthetic Asian elephant <laughs> that maybe might look like a mammoth Ooh. to all intents and purposes, but it would be an Asian elephant with a few little tweaks. Well, what would that mean? To have have a woolly mammoth mm. or any derivative thereof to be walking on the earth yeah. with us humans? I think that's a big question, isn't it? It's a question that all of us have to ask ourselves. I mean, it's coming, it's moving from the situation where it was an impossible thought to, to maybe something which we should have to consider more seriously. And we have to start asking ourselves the questions, is this something we should be doing as well as the fact that we could do it? Do we actually want it? What could the legacy of this be? I mean, my personal feeling is that at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a way of doing this without involving some Asian elephants. And I can't see that we can justify experimenting right, on those. We've got to run, but this is so fascinating. The, the program is How to Clone a Woolly Mammoth. It premieres tomorrow on Smithsonian Channel, which partners with Showtime, a division of CBS.